of Health for the World. Good morning to everyone that has joined for today's internal medicine grant rounds titled Skin and Soft Tissue Infections. Infections, and our guest speaker today is Dr. Ame Khan. Dr. Khan is an associate program professor of medicine in Southern Illinois University. Uh, he completed his medical degree in Shifa College of Medicine in Pakistan and continued uh, his internal medicine, uh, medicine residency at Bassett Medical Center in New York. He then completed his infectious disease fellowship at Southern Illinois University, where he currently works as an infectious disease uh, specialist. Uh, Dr. Khan, thank you so much for being here today and for the lecture. We can begin now. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Dr. Montes. Um, it's a privilege and a pleasure to talk at this forum. Uh, we will be talking about skin and soft tissue infections. I believe this is a very important topic that all clinicians need to be aware of as um, we will all encounter this at some point in our uh, careers. So it's important to have a basic understanding of all the entities that this entails. So to start with, I would like to say that I do not have any financial disclosures. The objectives of this presentation is to define various skin and soft tissue infections recognize their presentation, identify their common etiologic factors, and then outline that treatment. To start with, uh, I think it is essential to know about the basic anatomy of the skin as it pertains to these different infections. As these various different entities that uh, comprise skin and soft tissue infections affect and invade um, various depths of the skin and soft tissue barrier. Uh, to name them, um, this may involve either the epidermis, the dermis, down through the superficial fascia, through the subcutaneous, through the deep fascia, and through the muscle. So there are a number of entities, all of these uh, that are listed on this slide we will talk about. So something that is common to all um, of these conditions, the predisposing factors for these include skin breakdown and trauma, retained foreign bodies, lymphedema, swelling, venous stasis, vascular insufficiency, obesity, poor hygiene, and immunodeficiency. And we will talk about some of the more unique ones as we go through each of these conditions. I would like to start off with talking about folliculitis. So folliculitis is a pyoderma which is located within and around hair follicles. They present as small red papules and pustules. And the most common etiologic agents that have been implicated are listed below. Most commonly, Staphylococcus aureus is the offending pathogen. However, Pseudomonas, Candida, and Malassezia furfa are amongst a few others. In addition to these infectious causes, there are certain non-infectious causes that are also implicated. These include eosinophilic pustular folliculitis, which commonly occurs in immunocompromised people, especially seen in HIV AIDS individuals. And then you have amicrobial pustulosis as well. This slide gives a typical picture of folliculitis. As you can see, you, we can see multiple um, uh, pustules that have a hair follicle at their center. And then each of these is surrounded by a thin rim of erythema. Another picture here, uh, this represents hot tub folliculitis. It is commonly associated with baths um, or tubs that have been, that are colonized with various organisms, typically pseudomonas. Uh, 
uh, an important uh, factor which differentiates this from other folliculitis is that there is usually a sharp demarcation between the normal skin as well as the affected skin, which is essentially at the barrier of uh, where the air meets the water. So in terms of treatment, uh, folliculitis is fairly self-limited. Usually local measures are enough with cold compressors and they, these do resolve by themselves. However, at times topical antibiotic bacterials or antifungals are necessary. And examples of these include mupirocin or clotrimazole. And then for more severe and widespread infection, oral antibiotics may be used. If there is refractory disease or disease that is very severe, Biopsy may be necessary, and the purpose of that essentially is to look for atypical pathogens, number one, and to look for certain non-infectious causes that we alluded to earlier. Then next we move on to furuncles and carbuncles. So they are um, defined, furuncles are defined essentially as um, deep inflammatory nodules, which develop from a folliculitis. So it is kind of an extension of folliculitis. They may be centered around a single follicle or they may have, or they may involve a few follicles. Whereas a carbuncle is a much more extensive process where many furuncles kind of, they coalesce together um, and they always involve multiple follicles, and it is a more severe disease. Both of these usually develop at, in areas of the skin um, with hair follicles, which are um, exposed to friction and perspiration. And commonly, they involve the face, the bearded area, the neck, um, the axillary region, or the groin. However, they can happen anywhere. The most common etiologic agent is, again, Staphylococcus aureus. However, in immunocompromised and elderly people, coagulase negative Staphylococci have also been observed. Here we have pictures of a furuncle and a carbuncle. On the left, you see a furuncle with an inflammatory nodule, a central, central area of um, purulence, and it, it, as I mentioned, is um, usually centered around a single or very few follicles. Whereas on the right, where we see a carbuncle, we can see that it originated, seems like it originated from multiple hair follicles, which kind of coalesce. And carb carbuncles usually have a thicker overlying skin, and the deeper uh, pockets of pus are usually separated by connective tissue. So predisposing factors for these include obesity, diabetes mellitus, immunocompromise of other origin. And typically um, it's been observed that blood, people with blood dyscrasias have a higher preponderance of developing these. Treatment um, involves moist heat for mild cases and smaller lesions. And often this leads to spontaneous drainage. Incision and drainage may be needed for larger lesions. And systemic antibiotics are commonly used if there is associated cellulitis, if there is facial involvement, or if there are systemic, or if there is systemic illness. In terms of antimicrobials, uh, anti-staphylococcal beta-lactam, such as dicloxacillin, and first-generation cephalosporins are commonly used. Alternatively, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or clindamycin may be used, especially in people uh, who are allergic to beta-lactams. For severe disease, initially, parenteral antibiotics may be used. Uh, options include vancomycin, daptomycin, linazolid, or ceftaralin, to name some. And this can subsequently be transitioned to oral antibiotics once there is clinical improvement. 
Before we move on to the next topic, I think it is important to note that general care measures are extremely important with carbuncles and furuncles. So general skin care and hygiene, washing with, with soap and water, um, keeping it dry, uh, care of clothing, i.e. Uh, washing um, clothes regularly, washing bed linens, bedding, etc., and changing dressings if they get soaked um, as soon as possible are extremely important in controlling this uh, or these infections. So the next topic of discussion is impetigo. Uh, impetigo is a superficial infection. It involves the epidermis. The offending pathogens, they um, invade into the epidermis and infect subcorneal keratinocytes, leading to inflammation. They initially present as vesicular lesions. These vesicular lesions then um, rupture, releasing their fluid contents, which then um, end up crusting. And typically, it, this crust is described as a honey crust, and we will see a picture in the next slide. Pruritus is common with impetigo, and it can be spread with scratching. So patients should be told, uh, should be advised not uh, try to, to try to avoid this, um, as it can cause local spread, as well as it can lead to auto inoculation of other areas of the skin. It is most commonly seen in children. However, elderly adults uh, do have this at times as well. And it is common in hot and humid environments most commonly. The etiologic agent historically, streptococcus groups A, B, C, and G um, used to be the most common pathogen that caused it. However, over the past couple of decades, staph aureus is getting more and more common. And as we go through these talks, or this talk, uh, we, uh, one will notice that streptococci and staph aureus are the most common offending pathogens with most, if not all, of these infections. Here's a classic picture of impetigo. And one can see how it gets uh, the name of honey crusting, as we can see that at the lower, mainly at the lower lip margin, we can see the dried up secretions um, which have uh, left behind a kind of a golden, golden yellow, golden brown um, residue. So treatment starts with local care. It's with removal of crusts with soap and water. And then topical therapy for limited disease. Again, this involves use of muparosin, retapamulin, or fusidic acid. Uh, fusidic acid use is decreasing because of increasing resistance of these pathogens, but commonly mupirocin is used. For more extensive disease, um, oral antibiotics may be used, similar to before, amoxicillin, first-generation cephalosporins, antistaphylococcal uh, penicillin, such as dicloxacillin, or trimethoprim sulfa, clindamycin, or macrolides, macrolides may be used with those who are allergic. I would like to point out at this point that even though clindamycin and macrolides have been used in the past, resistance is increasing. So this should be kept in mind um, when, when, when prescribing these antimicrobials, especially with macrolides as most of the offending pathogens, especially Staphylococcus, um, are now resistant to many macrolides, um, almost universally to erythromycin. So uh, at this point, before we move on to the next um, um, ATR or the next um, infection, I would like to briefly mention um, certain complications of streptococcal impetigo seen with groups A, C, and G most commonly. The main one that I want to mention briefly is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which is an anti antigen antibody complex disease, which can lead to nephrotic syndrome. And, is it seen, and it is seen with certain nephrotogenic strains. So not necessarily occurring with all impetigo, 
but certainly this, some, this is something that needs to be on our radar. The next uh, thing is rheumatic fever. It is extremely rare with impetigo. Some even say that it never happens. It, it happens more commonly with um, group A streptococcal uh, pharyngitis, but I thought it would be important to briefly give it a mention over here. So another variant is bullous impetigo. It's also a superficial infection of the epidermis. It also starts as vesicles. However, the differentiating factor is that it transforms into bullae, and these bullae then quickly rupture, um, uh, which leaves uh, a moist red surface, and then the fluid from that um, develops a brown crust. The etiology for this is Staphylococcus aureus, and typically um, strains of Staphylococcus aureus, which express exfoliative toxins A and B. Here's a typical image of bullous impetigo. We can see that on the right side of this image, we see three unruptured bullae with serous fluid. And on the left, we can see the residue uh, from um, a couple of similar bullae. Treatment is fairly similar to um, impetigo. Topical treatments may be used, including mupirocin or ratapamilin, and then penicillinase-resistant penicillin, such as dicloxacillin, first-generation cephalosporins, um, can be used in those who are sensitive and at um, a lower risk of MRSA. And then for those who have a higher risk of MRSA, and uh, who or who may be allergic to penicillins, we can use clindamycin, trimethoprim sulfa, erythromycin, or linezolid. Again, with the caveat that there is increasing resistance with clinda and erythromycin. So eczema is the next topic. Uh, it is similar to impetigo, at least initially. However, um, it does in uh, it does invade deeper. Uh, as the uh, process goes on, it goes through into the uh, superficial dermis. It is also more common in children. However, you can see it in older adults, especially those who are immunocompromised. The differentiating factor from impetigo is that the ulcers, as I said, are deeper, so they present um, as punched out ulcers. And they have usually have a greenish yellow crust. And these are surrounded by a surrounding um, violaceous margin. Etiologies for this are many and varied. So I will only uh, mention the most common ones. Group A streptococcus, staphylococcus aureus, and pseudomonas aeruginosa, which causes a typical um, ectema, which we have a picture of on the next slide. Treatment is similar to impetigo as well. So on the left, we see a um, typical uh, presentation of ectema, where, where we see this punched out ulcer in the center surrounded by some inflammation with erythema. And then on the right side, as I mentioned, um, as with pseudomonas, you develop uh, what is uh, called ectema gangrenosum. And this is a very classic appearance of this, where we see an almost necrotic appearing dark green center surrounded by a rim of erythema. So we're moving on to erysipelas next. Erysipelas is um, a very important topic um, that I think all of us uh, should, should learn to recognize. Um, it's a superficial infection. It involves the epidermis and the superficial dermis. Uh, it is acute of acute onset, it's painful, and it is a rapidly spreading infection. It has an erythematous plaque of inflammation. The skin is quite impressively indurated, red, and um, very well demarcated. So that is something that can differentiate it from other um, diffuse infections of the skin. And systemic signs are common. So you can see fever, malaise, lethargy, um, and, and leukocytosis with this. We have two pictures of erysipelas over here. 
one on the face on the left and the one on an extremity on on the right and we can see that the skin even on this picture looks looks thickened and indurated and we have quite um well demarcated margins so predisposing factors are fairly similar uh, to what we talked about before in addition, alcohol abuse, nephrotic syndrome, and paraparesis have also been implicated. The most common etiology is streptococcus, mainly on the extremities. However, it can cause erysipelas anywhere. On the face, staphylococcus aureus is thought to be um, also much more uh, commonly implicated than elsewhere in the body, on the body, sorry. By, uh, this is a clinical diagnosis as are most skin and soft tissue infections uh, and biopsy with cultures are not needed. However, in such certain research settings, they have been done and um, have only yielded an organism in a minority of patients. Recurrence is common and it often occurs in the same area. And this is attributed to um, lymphatic and um, kind of post venous obstruction uh, by uh, the pathogens and the inflammation that is associated with it. So there are certain general principles for most of these infections in, and this holds true for erysipelas as well. So elevation of the extremity is essential with mild or early disease, uh, oral penicillin V or intramuscular Procaine penicillin may be used. Um, in addition, macrolides or clindamycin may be used in those who have penicillin allergies. And those who have extensive involvement um, should be hospitalized and at least initially treated with parenteral antimicrobials, which may include aqueous penicillin, a first generation cephalosporin such as cefazolin or ampicillin sulbactam. So the next condition um, that I wanted to talk about is cellulitis. It is similar to erysipelas as it is more diffuse. However, there are certain differentiating factors. Uh, it involves the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous tissue, as opposed to uh, erysipelas, which often does not involve deeper structures. Previous trauma or an underlying skin lesion may predispose to this, such as eczema, um, dermatophytosis, etc. And uh, typically, there is rapid development of pain, tenderness, swelling, erythema, and warmth, typical of inflammation elsewhere. It is not as sharply demarcated uh, as erysipelas, and that is the differentiating factor from it. And systemic symptoms, as with erysipelas, are common. Classically, cellulitis is divided into purulent and or non-purulent cellulitis. Uh, lymphatic spread and bacteremia can occur, and uh, it is not uncommon. And it may, um, in severe forms, lead to hemodynamic compromise as well. Etiologic agents, again, most commonly involve streptococci, groups A, B, C, and G, and Staphylococcus aureus, but sometimes gram-negative rods are observed as well. And as with erysipelas, recurrence is common, commonly occurring in people who have lymphedema and stasis. We have pictures of cellulitis on this slide. On the left, we have non purulent cellulitis, where we can see kind of this Erythema, um, sometimes this erythema may be um, separated by kind of patches or islands of non-inflamed skin. And we can see that the, the margins are a little, um, not as clearly demarcated as, uh, as erysipelas. Uh, and that may be something that can be used to differentiate the two entities. On the right, we see purulent cellulitis, where we can see a cellulitic area, erythematous area surrounding an area of pus. Uh, 
there are some general principles for the treatment of cellulitis. Um, elevation of the affected extremity is important. Sterile and cool dressings may be used to remove purulent exudates and incision and drainage may be needed for larger abscesses. For purulent cellulitis, we want to include MRSA coverage when we prescribe antimicrobials, whereas with non-purulent cellulitis, it's important to use penicillinase resistant beta lactams to cover both MSSA and hemolytic streptococci. Mild disease may be treated with oral antibiotics, whereas moderate to severe disease should at least initially uh, be treated with parenteral antibiotics, and then subsequently they can be switched to enteral antibiotics. So the antibiotics that can um, and are used often um, to kind of cover uh, streptococci include amoxicillin or first generation cephalosporins, clindamycin or trimethoprim sulfa. For staph aureus coverage, uh, we can use oxicillin, nafcillin, cefazolin, clindamycin, etc. Whereas with, uh, for, with MRSC, we can use vancomycin, daptomycin, clindamycin, doxycycline, trimethoprim sulfa, and linazolid. So I think there are certain special circumstances that uh, clinicians should be aware of. There are certain locations where the microbial flora is different and we need to uh, target those. In particular, perioral, perirectal areas, um, cellulitis that are associated with the pubitus ulcers, um, fistulas such as enteric fistulas, and diabetic foot ulcers, they should include gram negative and anaerobic coverage. Uh, these may include beta lactam, beta lactamase inhibitor combinations, ceftriaxone or quinolone with a metronidazole combination, or, or a carbapenem. Another special circumstance is human or animal bites, and in these as well, a beta lactam, beta lactamase uh, inhibitor combination uh, is preferred. So this is a good segue to briefly talk about animal bites as these are often um, associated with infection of the skin and deeper structures. So certain general principles are listed on this slide. This involves local care with irrigation and debridement. Imaging should be done to assess for any fractures to get a baseline for osteomyelitis, which may, which may follow these bites and also to detect any retained foreign bodies. Wound closure um, should not be pursued and prophylactic antibiotics are often given because these, um, these sites often do become infected. And the need for vaccines should be evaluated and these should be administered after adequate evaluation, such as tetanus um, or rabies vaccination. We'll first talk about cat bites. Um, so due to the nature of cat bites, due to how their teeth are shaped, these bites are usually very deep and uh, they may at times puncture the bone as well, leading to osteomyelitis. Uh, most of these get infected. Most, so more than 80% uh, in some studies show, show that these uh, get infected. And because of the oral flora of the cat, um, the infection is often polymicrobial, involving um, anaerobic bacteria as well. Uh, one can get a non-purulent or purulent cellulitis with or without lymphangitis, and certain people can also develop abscesses. A couple of microorganisms that I thought were important to mention as they relate to cat bites are listed on this slide. Number one is Pasteurella maltosida, which is found almost always in all cat bites, uh, or, uh, and they almost always cause infection. They're gram-negative rods, and the good thing is they are almost universally sensitive to amoxicillin. So amoxicillin should be part of 
the treatment regimen for these infections. The other organism that I wanted to talk about was Bartonella hensley, uh, typically implicated with causing cat scratch disease. Uh, it is implicated in both bites and scratches. Most commonly, it causes a limited regional lymphadenitis. Um, however, um, especially in immunocompromised individuals, it can cause um, more severe disease, including generalized lymphadenitis, hepatosplenic disease, um, neurologic disease, endocarditis, et cetera. And we have multiple options for treatment, including macrolide, trimethoprim sulfa, ciprofloxacin, or rifampin. Next, we talk about dog bites. Uh, as opposed to cat bites, most do not get infected. Um, in addition to other common pathogens that cause skin and soft tissue infections, a uh, couple of organisms that are typical to dog bites include Pasteurella canis and Capnocytophaga canemorsis. Um, I would like to briefly mention uh, the role of Capnocytophaga canemorsis in people who have had splenectomy. Uh, in these people, this can cause overwhelming sepsis and mortality. So it is important to recognize these patients and treat them promptly. In addition to local care that I mentioned earlier, um, a beta-lactam, beta-lactam is inhibitor or a penicillin G with a clindamycin should be used in combination. Next, we have rat bites. Uh, rat bites can lead to um, um, a condition called rat bite fever. The skin manifestations of this um, it may include a maculopapular, pustular, petechial, purpuric, or an echomotic crash. They have associated symmetric polyarthralgia and fevers, as the name implies. And they are caused by two main pathogens, streptobacillus moniliformis and spirillium minus. And they are treated with penicillin or with doxycycline. Um, it is important to identify um, exposure to water when they are associated with skin and soft tissue infections. Um, so the, the type of water exposure is uh, important to recognize. So if there is salt water or brackish water exposure, especially in people who fish or who handle shellfish, uh, there is concern for Vibrio vulnificus, which can cause um, kind of um, different severities of disease. It can cause quite overwhelming necrotizing infectious infections and um, sepsis and septic shock, especially in people who have liver disease, who have cirrhosis, who have hemochromatosis or other high iron states. Um, and other than local care um, in terms of antimicrobials, in addition to usual um, covering usual pathogens, uh, we would also like to add doxycycline to people who are suspected of having this. Another microorganism that is implicated in saltwater exposure, especially in people who handle fish, who clean fish, uh, is Erysipelothrix roseopathiae. And um, these usually involve the fingers and the hands as the microorganism is um, inoculated in the fingers when, when, when people clean the fish. And treatment for this involves penicillin, cephalosporin, clindamycin, or quinolones. Freshwater exposure, um, what we can, we're concerned about in these cases is Aeromonas hydropila, which again can cause a, very, a varied spectrum of severity and often treated with ciprofloxacin and other antibiotics that are commonly used for skin and soft tissue infection. So certainly include ciprofloxacin to their regimen. Here are pictures of all three. On the left, we see a limb with um, typical findings of Vibrio vulnificus infection. Often we see these hemorrhagic dark bullae. In the center, we see a case of erysipelothrix where we see that there is a swollen inflamed finger 
um, and this this is kind of an ascending infection from an area of um, local inoculation. And then on the right, we see Aeromonas hydrophila. On the left of that image, we see typical kind of cellulitic findings. On the right, we see bullet formation. So the next entity um, that we're gonna transition into is necrotizing fasciitis. So um, from this point on, we're talking about much more deeper infections, necrotizing fasciitis being one of the more important uh, or the most more commonly seen one, should I say. It is an extensive infection. It is very acute in onset most, most of the time. Uh, it involves deeper structures down into the subcutaneous tissue, down to the deep fascia, and sometimes even, excuse me, penetrating through the deep, fa the deep fascia. There are various types described according to the types of pathogens that may be isolated. Type one is polymicrobial, type two is monomicrobial, most commonly group A streptococcus. And then type three, are associated with marine gram-negative organisms that we mentioned previously, most commonly Vibrio and Aeromonas. Predisposing factors include trauma, which often times is quite minor. Diabetes mellitus is implicated in many of these infections, peripheral arterial disease, cirrhosis, intravenous drug use, and immunosuppression. So it's quite acute and quite progressive. It can affect any part of the body. However, the extremity, extremities are uh, most commonly involved. And in terms of the clinical presentation, it often starts with erythema, swelling, warmth, uh, typical of any skin and soft tissue infection. However, what separates it from more superficial and milder infections is the severe pain and tenderness that is seen and usually it's out of proportion to, to what you see um, on clinical exam. This erythema then progresses from a red purple to a blue gray discoloration, leading to skin breakdown and eventually uh, leading to bullet and frank cutaneous gangrene. There may be crepitus as well. Uh, and anesthesia of the skin can be seen at any point and if we, if we observe this, uh, it should cue us to the diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis. Compartment syndrome can be a complicating factor. And so these most, all, almost all of these uh, patients are quite systemically sick. Here are two typical pictures where we can see this dusky blue gray discoloration of skin with overlying bullying. So we see lab abnormalities, uh, which are more pronounced with neck fash. We can see a pronounced leukocytosis, hyponatremia, azotemia, and then gram stain findings of these, the fluid from the bullet or from, from the tissue upon surgery may show a polymicrobial or a monomicrobial infection. I wanted to point out uh, Fournier's gangrene, which is a special form of necrotizing fasciitis that is important to uh, recognize. It can happen in, uh, in, uh, at any age and in any gender. It involves the perineum. It may be localized, but it does have a propensity to spread rapidly, and that is why it's important to recognize. And it is often polymicrobial, are uh, owing to the location of the infection. So number one for necrotizing fasciitis, we need to think about it. it, it we should have a very high clinical suspicion uh, and treatment is immediate and extensive surgical debridement um, and exploration essentially. Um, the wound should be left open, uh, open. often uh, repeat surgeries are needed. And initial antimicrobial therapy should cover for uh, empirically for, for a polymicrobial infection. And this can subsequently be tailored to gram stain and culture data. 
So next we're gonna talk about myositis and myonecrosis. Um, these can be caused by uh, many different etiologies. However, uh, we will talk about the two most common ones uh, and we'll start off with group A streptococcal necrotizing myositis. This is an acute and severe illness. It is frequently associated with toxic shock. And um, these patients are very sick in appearance. They manifest with intense pain, rigidity, and swelling of, inf uh, of the affected muscles. Um, oftentimes, especially initially, the skin may be unaffected. Uh, and these patients, people, um, Will, will, will not have much overlying signs, but they are um, extremely sick appearing and they will have severe pain and tenderness. However, later on, um, the, the infection may surface and they may present with findings similar to necrotizing fasciitis. It is often associated bacteria, with bacteremia and shock, as I mentioned. And again, compartment syndrome uh, can complicate this process. There, is, um, labor there are laboratory abnormalities of extensive and severe leukocytosis and elevated CPK, um, which can be helpful in the diagnosis as well. Imaging such as with ultrasound, CT, or MRI may be obtained. However, this should never delay surgical intervention. Uh, if, we suspect, if we suspect necrotizing myositis, these patients should immediately be taken to the OR. And treatment involves prompt and extensive surgery in addition to high-dose penicillin G and clindamycin. But despite extensive um, and aggressive treatment, the mortality is extremely high. Here we have a couple of pictures of necrotizing myositis and we can see that it is very impressive. Especially on the left, we can see that there is a there appears to be extensive necrosis of the muscle. There is frank discoloration of the muscle, um, which appears to be to almost totally necrosed. And on the right, um, we see another example. So finally, uh, we talk about um, glostridial myonecrosis, commonly known as gas gangrene. Uh, this is also uh, an acute and very rapidly progressive infection of skeletal muscle. This also has very high mortality and the causative agents are all clostridia, as the name uh, implicates. Most common um, pathogen implicated is clostridium perforingens. However, other clostridia um, are also implicated. They include uh, include but are not limited to Clostridium novii, Clostridium septicum, which can be seen with bacteremia and distant sites of uh, myonecrosis, and Clostridium sordoli, which is typically seen with septic abortions. Um, often this follows muscle injury when these wounds are contaminated with Clostridial spores. Um, often occurring when soil contaminates infection, infect, um, these areas. Typical and common scenarios include traumatic injuries, especially associated with compound fractures, and if soil contaminates these injuries, penetrating war wounds, uh, bowel and biliary tract surgery, septic abortions, um, and people who have arterial insufficiency with minor wounds can sometimes develop this. Predisposing factors include diabetes, peripheral arterial disease, devitalized tissue is extremely, uh, is something that is uh, almost always implicated and therefore uh, early debridement is recommended. Foreign bodies, neutropenia and intestinal tract abnormalities are also implicated. Clinical manifestations can be similar to group A streptococcal myonecrosis. This can develop very rapidly, sometimes within a few hours. They have severe pain, which is usually out of proportion to the physical findings or the mechanism of injury. 
crepitus may be observed, there's tense edema with bullae and bleb formation. These may release foul smelling dark fluid. The skin may be bronze appearing, which then progresses to uh, frank necrosis. These patients, as I said, are very toxic. Fever, interestingly, is usually low grade. And if at times there may be, there may be hypothermia, which is a poor prognostic sign. These people are hemodynamically stable almost always, or unstable, sorry, almost always, and they have shock. You can see the extensive necrosis over here again, uh, which is fra just frank gangrene uh, on both of these images. Tip, some uh, pathognomonic laboratory abnormalities that we can see include decreased hematocrit, um, uh, initial leukocytosis, and then a gram stain of these lesions will show many gram-positive bacilli with blunt ends. And interestingly, we do not see many polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Treatment is similar to group A myositis, group A streptococcus myositis with emergent surgical exploration and debridement and a combination of high dose penicillin G and clindamycin. So I would like to conclude with a summary. Um, it is important to have a basic understanding of the microbiologic etiology. The location and severity of disease guides initial treatment as does, uh, as do ep epidemiological risk factors. And fulminant in infection can develop very rapidly. So I think there should be a high clinical suspicion for deeper infections. And if so, we should get urgent surgical consultation. With this, I will conclude my presentation and I would, uh, I would open the floor to any comments or questions. Thank you so much for this comprehensive uh, review, Dr. Khan. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, amazing pearls that you were giving us uh, throughout the lecture. Uh, I have a couple questions myself, and um, I also encourage the rest of the attendees to ask any questions that they, they may have. So my first question was, I was wondering about what's the usual trigger for a Fournier gangrene? And, and why? So, yeah. That's a very important question, uh, a very good question. Uh, there may or may not be a trigger. Uh, sometimes superficial, often unnoticed trauma may be uh, something that triggers it. Um, some certain interventions like urological interventions can do that as well. Certain people who have um, abnormalities of the genitourinary tract may be predisposed. People, for example, like paraphimosis, et cetera, they may have it more commonly, but it is um, not necessary to have an inciting factor. Uh, as I mentioned in the talk, a lot of these people have um, diabetes mellitus. Often they have quite poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. So that is um, a, a predisposing factor. And people like this, when you see findings of cellulitis, for example, or inflammation of the area, it should always raise suspicion for four years. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the other question was, I was wondering about what's the prognosis for these patients with uh, group A uh, myofasciitis and, and gas gangrene, they seem extremely uh, aggressive mm -hmm. lesions. And, and I was just wondering how do they do uh, if they are able to seek uh, treatment uh, in time? Yeah. So unfortunately, these, these patients have a very, very poor prognosis because of the extent of injury and um, the inflammatory cascade that is triggered by these injuries and also by the toxins that are released. Many uh, or, or, or some of the studies that, that I have seen say that the mortality even with prompt treatment may be as high as 70 to 90 percent. With clostridial gangrene, it may approach 100 percent. So they are extremely severe. That's why it is very important 
to try to recognize them early and take them for extensive debridement. And oftentimes in the OR, they will remove most, if not of the tissue that they see, they will even remove some of the normal appearing tissue because, uh, because there may be subclinical uh, presence of these bacteria. And oftentimes when they take them to the OR, they might just go ahead and do an amputation uh, to prevent the mortality that is associated with this. Mm -hmm. I see. And I'm guessing uh, uh, Fournier's gangrene's numbers are similar, 70% plus. Uh... So Fournier's gangrene, interestingly, actually is not as bad as myositis. So that the numbers that, the numbers that I gave were mainly for uh, myonecrosis with Fournier's gangrene and necrotizing fasciitis, even though they are high, they are much lower than that with myonecrosis. I see. And then uh, a last question. I remember one of the most uh, interesting patients I had during med school was, was a patient with uh, pyoderma gangrenosum. Uh, mm -hmm. The patient was initially treated as a skin infection and uh, as it you know, as, 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 uh, as the patient evolved, it ended up being a pyoderma. So I was wondering, is there anything else, is there anything that can point you towards thinking about a pyoderma in the early stages of, of the disease? So pyoderma is, is an interesting entity. It's an inflammatory entity rather than an infectious entity, which can, which can sometimes be non-distinguished looking just looking at it from uh, an infectious etiology something that may uh, cue us in or clue us in um, is if these people usually have recurrent uh, disease they may have a previous history of this and then if they are not improving with appropriate um, kind of wound care and appropriate antimicrobial treatment, that should make us think of other etiologies such as pyoderma. And with, with something like pyoderma, it is important to get a biopsy um, of the affected area to look at the histopathology and differentiate it from, from infectious etiologies. Right. Well, thank you so much. Seems like we do not have any uh, questions from our audience. Uh, Dr. Khan, it was a really uh, excellent lecture. As I told you before, uh, excellent pearls that you were giving uh, throughout the lecture. So thank you so much for, 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 for your time. Thank you very much. It's, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to talk with, with all of you. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity. Likewise. Uh, see you next time. See you. Take care.